right, welcome to SPX 2021 and the panel Playing with the Medium, featuring artists who specialize in subverting and breaking the typical forms and visuals of conventional comics. I'm Craig Fisher, and I teach an Introduction to Comics and Graphic Novels course at Appalachian State University in North Carolina. And I'm thrilled to host the panel, and I've asked each of our panelists to introduce themselves and, if they want, to share an image or page that displays how their comics exemplify experimentation and new techniques. And if it's okay, I'll just start in alphabetical order, which puts you up first, Joe. I'm first. Yep. Okay. Sorry. So <laughs> I have to share my screen, don't I? And then I will introduce myself. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Kessler. I'm an artist and I'm the art director of Breakdown Press. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Um, and I don't really think of myself as a formalist, but then having thought that initially, then I realized the comic I was working on at the moment as these two characters walking along and it starts raining and there's no words and they go into a little barn and um, there's a donkey and then stories start coming out of each other's mouths, stories start coming out of their mouths. <laughs> so I suppose that was quite formal, but I wasn't really thinking about it in those terms. So we can talk about that kind of thing, perhaps. I love the fact that you're representing the stories as little people running out of their mouths. That's neat. Yeah, and then, and then you drop into the story, I guess. But also these are all fairly unfinished, but you know, also probably will be about what they end up looking like. Okay, that's pretty right. enough. Great, <laughs> How thank you, Joe. There? Ching, do you want to share an image with us or just tell us about what you do? Um, yeah, I can share an image. Um, so I actually don't think I'm on this panel because my comics are, are breaking any, any interesting boundaries in comics, but um, I am also an installation artist and a game designer. And uh, my work overlaps a lot kind of between these three fields. So let me hit share screen and I'll show you some of my work. There we go. Ah, there. Okay, um, let me figure out. Like, so these are my books, my two published books, The American Dream and The Legend of Auntie Po. I frankly think these are very straightforward graphic novels, um, but this is the large immersive installation art that I build. And these are large immersive structures that are experienced by um, physical storytelling, by physical objects and physical space as well as trying to figure out how we leave enough space for the audience to tell their own stories within these giant art structures. Um, this is a piece of traditional installation gallery work, and it's actually meant to be experienced as, as a sequential narrative. Um, each box contains hidden letters and, uh, letters and postcards, and as you progress through the boxes, you uh, sort of unravel the story about museum curator and absent father. And this is an example of installation art that uses props and staging to frame the art in a manner not entirely different from a traditional sequential narrative. Um, but the kind of immersive installation work that I make does feel really different from comics. Um, a big thing is that you don't actually get to control what the audience sees and when, and you don't even know what part of the story they absorb or if they are at all. But I do find it very rewarding to turn, you know, flat comic-y drawings into actual physical spaces. Um, this is another one of my installation projects. It is a story about a fortune teller who, um, you know, gives kind divinations to people. And I've performed this at comic conventions. I performed it um, as part of gallery shows and in game, um, game uh, you know, events as well. This is what it looks like in real life. Uh, and I made custom capsule cabinets. These are a couple of them. I'm currently working on modifying some of them uh, to dispense zines because uh, laundry detergent machines as well as sanitary pad um, dispensers are actually perfect for dispensing nice little boxed items. Um, this is a mending. It's a solo storytelling keepsake game that I designed. And in this, players embroider their path on a screen printed map and they pull cards with story prompts on them. And this was something that was very much, um, it, I kind of use it as a tool with my comics, this type of story building card scenario. Um, but I also do feel that the act of telling a story this way 
does resonate a lot with me kind of in my work as a cartoonist as well. So that's what I have to share. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little bit of like a weird spread of work, but. Not weird at all. And we're actually gonna, I'm, I'm gonna ask you more questions about your installation work and how it connects to comics in a few minutes. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Matt, I think you're up now. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a few images to share from uh, my new book, uh, Ex Libris, which is coming out soon. Um, we're waiting. I have, there are 20 copies in America right now. The rest are on a boat somewhere in the Pacific, and we're hoping they're going to show up in time for the release in a few weeks. Um, all right, so let me get the screen up here. All right, everyone see that cover of the book? Yeah. All right, so um, this is uh, uh, a graphic novel, pretty straightforward in the, in the sort of form and, and storytelling of it. And uh, it's about a character uh, in a room reading a lot of books. So it's very much about the medium and the way comics work and the way reading works and how we interact with, with fiction and, and with comics in particular. So this is a little two page example. Um, you can see that um, it's sort of a first person view of someone reading a book. And it's kind of like a sort of European style mystery novel, you know, kind of private dick, hard boiled kind of thing. Um, and in the book, someone's kind of, you know, there's sort of a chase sequence going on. The character turns the page and at that point a, a loose sheet of paper seems to be falling out of the page and whether coincidentally or not it's interacting with the story in the comics you can see someone saying hey you know you see a surprise character someone saying what the you know kind of the car and someone saying look out uh, on the next page we see the uh you know a woman screaming a car screeching someone looking over a cliff saying too late now and where they're looking also coincides with where the book, the page has now fallen out of the uh, book and is headed onto the floor. Um, and the character then picks that up. And we can see it's been tinted a little bit different. So I use color a lot to sort of signal shifts in different layers of the narrative and kind of self-referential kind of stuff. So, so this is the whole page again, ending with the character holding the page. Then you turn the page in the book. So this is a right-handed page, the, the recto page. When you turn the page, you get that you're holding now that actual page, which is, appears to be an original page of comic art. So I actually went into my files and found my oldest sheet of Bristol board from one of my <laughs> first books. It was all like yellowed and gummy. And I scanned it under this drawing and I put in sort of measurements. So you can see there's like the you know, percentage stuff, kind of like uh, indicia kind of stuff that you wouldn't normally see in a, in a printed comic book. Um, and then that page itself reveals itself to be kind of like a nested narrative where it's a comic page where oops, the first panel is um, a uh, close up of a comic page being drawn. Um, and then we kind of pull back from that. We see the artist drawing that page. And this one page comic is about this artist who's really sick of drawing this kind of thuggish, fascistic detective for the last 32 years. And he swears that if he ever met, met him in real life, he would you know, beat the crap out of him, at which points he that the hero of the, his, his comics shows up in the bar in a slightly more you know, pudgy version. Uh, and the guy challenges him to a fight, says, come on, give me your best shot, and you know, takes a swing at him, which actually brings us back to that first panel. We can see that um, it's actually him getting punched out at the end of his comic. So the whole thing is kind of a, a closed loop. So um, those two pages, I think, are a pretty good example of the multiple ways I'm sort of using Things like the page, the physical act of reading, but also like the, the way uh, comics and different layers of narrative work, something that I have a lot of fun playing around with. So, um, all right, and I'm going to try and get out of here without showing you all my desktop. Did that work? Thanks, Matt. That, that, right. that, that's a lot of fun. I noticed that I noticed that when I was reading it, that that page kind of looped in on itself. Uh, cool. that's, that's a neat trick. Wynn, how about you? Great. So let me share the screen. Hi, everybody. So my name is Wynn, and I do this multimedia comic. I've, I've worked on it for about eight years. It's called The Gulf, and the title refers to the Gulf, of, uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida, which is where I grew up, and this idea of division, um, generation, gen generational divide, cultural divide. Um, and it's, it's about a Vietnamese-American family that is inspired by my own family. And so my training is music and art. I've always done music and art simultaneously. And so as I started working on this comic, 
it just felt like a natural thing to do uh, to include music, to, to include animation. And um, yeah, so, and, and all of it through more traditional panels and, and captions and, and text um, in a comic. So I'll just read a page or two so you can get a sense. This is from the first chapter. I've completed five chapters so far. So the, uh, these, these two boys are, are sneaking out and it's at the middle of the night and they're, they're on a boat off to a little island. Some of Jeff's friends on the island show up. I decide to ramble along the beach on my own a while. Ow, walk away slowly. It's Angela. I tell her how Jeff and I snuck out. I hope it makes us sound cool. She looks kind of sleepy, like she just woke up or had been crying. So why are you still awake? And I'll play a little bit of the song. You say you can't sleep, you tried. But the moon was against you. The mosquito in your room was against you. So why try? I always can't sleep. Don't need a window seat. It's sea turtle hatching season, and right in front of us, the little ones are breaking out of their ping pong shaped eggs and slowly waddling their way into the sea. Look, that one's gone the wrong way. And this is supposed to have a little bit of animation. And that ends the book. Thanks. Neat. Thank you, Wynn. Thanks. Uh, you guys have already anticipated several of my questions based on the uh, images and, 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 and books and such that you've shown me. Um, but I want to start with a question that um, kind of goes back to your own roots. That is, it seems to me that all of you take inspiration from different media as well as comics. And I'd like to have each of you identify a non-cartoonist who influence your comics making practice and describe how that influence works on you and how you translate it to comics. So I thought we'd begin with Shing, who I thought, it seems to me that, uh, Shing, um, when you were showing me your installations and you were showing me that, was Joseph Cornell at all an influence for you Absolutely. or? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the reason why I was looking around um, is because I was looking to see if I had any books kind of laid out around. But um, yeah, no, Joseph Cornell is absolutely an, an inspiration. Um, another installation artist I find really inspiring is Gregor Schneider, who builds these large room, large room art installations that uh, are sort of recreations of his childhood homes. Um, and then in, in print, uh, one of the things that have just been part of my life for a really long time is this book. Oh, so, wow. Classic. Yeah. Um, so this book is a classic in my life, as is, uh, I'm looking around like this, uh, Griffin and Sabine. The Griffin mm, and yeah, Sabine yeah, yeah. series. The envelopes inside, yeah. As with the envelopes inside, just kind of that kind of uh, storytelling through printed ephemera in such like an epistolary manner, um, that, that resonates with me. And it's, it's in like all, all of my work. Um, I feel like I wear my inspirations just on my sleeve. Oh, uh, that's Craig, really interesting. Craig, I'm sorry, go ahead, Matt. Do you mind if we all kind of pile in and add stuff as we go here? I don't want to stretch it out for too long, but yeah, Gnomes, uh, I love that as a kid. My kids have gotten really into the Dinotopia books, which are also a similar thing of this whole sort and of- And from the same period, roughly, too. Uh, I think so, maybe after the Gnomes book, but yeah. But I wanted to say, Shing, one thing I thought of with your installations uh, is, and I'm trying to remember exactly the name, there was an installation, a Russian artist named, I think, Ilya Kabakov, and maybe working with like his wife or his, uh, you know, related partner, there's two names, first names. And I haven't seen stuff from him for years, but for a while I would see these big uh, installations that were like, I remember one was like kind of some kind of uh, apocalyptic event had happened and you'd walk through this large space and it really was kind of like, a very narrative cinematic, you know, kind of like a Tarkovsky, like a stalker or something, you're walking through this space, but there were like little um, origami little type paper people everywhere, which were, let's believe there's some kind of an alien race. And it was like very strange. You're just walking through and there's no, it's not like um, 
a totally structured narrative. You build your own story as you go and you kind of decide who these little figures might be and if they're sentient and all this kind of stuff. Anyway. That sounds amazing. Interesting. I'm yeah, not check it out. actually familiar with an artist, but clearly I have to be. Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> look it up and I'll send you the link. Please, there. please That's do. Awesome. I'd love to know more. I like them a lot. One of the things that you mentioned when you were talking about your installation, Shing, is that you drew an equivalency between, let's say, for example, the boxes that you put on the wall to sort of tell a narrative story in the panels. Do you think that that's the way in which your installation interest and, and your nested, your interest in sort of nested narrative books with envelopes or that kind of stuff uh, inflects your comics practice? Or what do you think? It's genuinely a little hard to tell um, because I've done both like for sort of simultaneously, they bleed into each other. Um, so when I build my boxes, I do think of panels because that is the other job that I do. Um, but I, I, do, I do definitely recognize that, you know, boxes are also physically simpler to build while in drawing, drawing a box versus drawing a different shape is completely irrelevant. Um, and yet, I do feel like I build my installations very similarly to how I draw my comics, if that kind of makes sense. Hmm. Not just oh, you know, talking about boxes and panels, but there, there is like a consistent through line, like the, the colors are very similar, the, um, the stories are very similar, even the pacing, I feel, between my installations and comics oh. are extremely similar. That's interesting. That's interesting. How, 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 just one final question. How, does, how can you influence pace in terms of uh, building an installation. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't know that much about installations at all. So I'm wondering uh, how you, it, I mean, there are ways of sort of controlling the pace by sort of changing the shapes of the panels. Do you do that in the installation or do you? Well, uh, to draw like the direct similarity, right? Like if you are walking down a hallway with nothing in it, you will walk down that hallway to move towards the next most interesting thing that you see. Um, Similarly, in a comics page, if there is no text, most people will gloss over the imagery and just kind of absorb it, and they will be looking for the next text box or the next box with some sort of, you know, interesting right. effect in it. Um, so, you know, if you paint, like, for instance, a long stretch of beach versus building a long hallway, the experience of proceeding through that is very similar for an audience, especially if there's a door at the end of it. Your hmm. goal is the door, you're headed towards the door. Hmm. Neat, neat, thank you. Matt, I'm pitching that question to you, uh, knowing full well your decades long interest in Olipo and Obapo, but if you want to answer the different uh, um, non-comics artistic influence, that would be great. Well, I'll stick with literature because that's been, the, that's really been the, the main focus lately. But I, you know, I draw from, uh, a lot from film and from music, uh, you know, and from fine art, uh, sort of like conceptual and process art is something that's I found really interesting. I found connections with the idea of working with constraints that is behind this whole Ubapo thing. So very briefly, if you're not familiar with Ulipo and Ubapo, it's a sort of French, started as a French literary uh, group slash drinking society uh, <laughs> that, you know, gets together and tries to come up with fun ways to make literature using uh, self-imposed rules, not as a way to create a kind of like airless formal box of art, but really with a similar goal to like the surrealists of creating, you know, the derangement of the senses, creating something really surprising and new, but instead of doing it through like total freedom and the subconscious and automatic writing, going in a counterintuitive opposite direction and saying, well, what happens if you do something really difficult to do? Like um, my, I did a 24 hour comic recently. And do I have a copy handy? called Bridge. Um, it was published as a mini couche earlier this year. And uh, it's only 24 pages long. And the story takes place over a 240 year time span because I gave myself the constraint of not only uh, doing it in 24 hours. I mean, I redrew it so it would look nice, but the actual story I wrote in 24 hours and the additional constraint was that every page, 10 years have to pass. Huh. So I had to figure out how to tell a story that would cover that entire time span. And, um, and it led me in a really interesting direction into kind of like a time loop, you know, kind of science fiction -y kind of thing, which, which uh, you know, I ended up being really pleased with. And it's a, very, it's, a much, it's a story I never would have made up without having that constraint, both the time limit and that particular thing of like telling a story where 10 years, you're jumping ahead by a decade, you know, every pitch. Um, so 
uh, with my, and so with my new book, uh, Ex Libris, uh, it wasn't necessarily coming straight out like I have the constraint that I'm going to follow, like a rule that I'm setting. Um, it actually harkened further back to my kind of earliest literary awakenings as a comp lit student, as an undergrad, and reading uh, Julio Cortazar's short stories, uh, you know, his story uh, that, that was the basis for the Antonioni film Blow Up, uh, you know, Axolotl, these stories like that, the continuity of parks, these famous very short stories that are about the process of storytelling and the circularity of the relationship between, you know, the reader and, and the author and the characters. Uh, Borges, uh, later on Nabokov and stuff like that. And at a certain point I read, uh, If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler, the novel, or novel by Italo Calvino, which some of you might know. Um, and that more than anything else was the inspiration for the impetus for Ex Libris. Cause I, I loved so much that idea in that book where it starts out addressing you, the reader, saying you've just bought the new Italo Calvino book. Uh, you know, let's take a look and you read the first chapter and it's this kind of mystery novel set in the train station in Eastern Europe or something. And it just stops cold and there's no more book. And the second chapter is like, wait, what happened to the book? Let's go look for it together. And you know, it becomes this sort of mystery novel with like really playful pastiches of different styles. And so this isn't really a continuation of that idea, but it's like taking that notion of, um, of uh, having fun with the way that, what we look for in stories. Like why do we even buy a book? Why do we read a book? What are we looking for? Uh, whether it's comics or, or short stories or, or a film um, and seeing how I could tease that out into a really engaging narrative, you know, not just have it be, you know, an exercise in style, which of course is my other, you know, thing that I'm known for. But so a lot of the ideas that I used in that exercise in style book, I'm putting now to like a narrative function. I, I tried to make it a very, you know, like if on a winter's night, uh, you know, a, a driving story that would like keep you moving through it. Um, and, and have this sort of structure of a mystery novel kind of superimposed on this, again, very playful sequences where I get to play around with the, uh, the fight, you know, between, like, you know, Nabokov always had, I, you know, I always struggle with him as a figure because he's so like daunting and overweening sometimes, but I really like his notion of literature as not really about what, how the characters change, it's about a, a kind of uh, throw down, you know, or sort of a, a struggle between the author and the reader, you know, by means of this book. It's like, the, it's like a dialogue you're having uh, with, with this book, the book being the third character, really. Um, so it's a little bit kind of that stuff, too. So all that stuff was, uh, was enormously influential on, on this book. And one of the powerful to, things um, about, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. <laughs> Please jump uh, in. Uh, I, I don't mean to sort of dominate. The I, I, I beat you to it, Matt, because I actually tried to rip off If One of Winter's Night a Traveler when I was an undergraduate student. <laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> what <laughs> I happened? See that what did you do? Unsuccessfully. Are you willing um, to share some? I would love to see some pages of that. It would take right. me about a month to find them, but I'm sure I still have them somewhere. <laughs> Please do. Please do. I'd love it to was like that. two pages, and I tried to do, um, <laughs> to like capture something of it. Uh, and then really didn't work at all. But it was the one huh. smoke clouds the beginning of the paragraph or whatever. I can't remember exactly. Right, right. Yeah, the, I think that's the second chapter. I think that begins with that. Yeah, and then sentence. I tried to do another one as well. And then when I did yeah. uh, my first book, I because I didn't really think anyone was going to read it, and I didn't fully <laughs> credit it and everything. It wasn't like I was trying to get away with anything. Yeah. Um. But I just and I was you know however old twenty one or something. <laughs> oh. Um. I just ripped off uh, a big chunk of Invisible Cities as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. You don't have to well, confess this, Joe, yeah, but now it's, it's down on video. I, I credited it. I didn't like try and pull a fast one, you know. I did. I did <laughs> yeah. acknowledge it in the thing, but um, I had like a paragraph of that was an intro to one of the stories. Awesome. Well, I'm yeah. eager to hear what you hear of Ex Libris then, because uh, you know, yeah, that was I, definitely I, the the idea was not to not to do a cover version, but to like take that idea and, and sort of you know run with it so i'm sure let me, I'm let sure me ask a question of everyone is a sort of subset of questions and then we'll get back to this question for joe and for win but um to what degree do you think this kind of self-referentiality or this kind of formal play if you want to call it that or self-referentiality being a subset of formal play right. how much is cleverness part of the process and part of the experience of reading it I know that to say that something is clever is almost to sort of dismiss it as being trite or, you know, insignificant, but I love cleverness. And your mention of Nabokov made me think of that because my favorite novel is probably Pale Fire, and it's just relentlessly exactly. funny and clever. 
That's and another main reference if, point if, for Ex Libris, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so I'm wondering, is is cleverness part of the reason why you all want to sort of push the boundaries or play around or add animation, let's say, for example, to a comic that you're creating? Is is cleverness part of it, or is that? Does, I don't mean that to sound dismissive, because like I said, I love cleverness. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I, I think it's fine. It's you know, I think I embrace. The cleverness is a kind of playfulness. It's having fun mm -hmm. with, you know, and, and fun is useless. You know, play is by nature, partly not doing stuff that is relevant or important. You know, you're having fun with stuff and that is a bit show off -y, you know? And um, I, you know, I definitely, I struggle with that a little bit. Like, can I just do a thing where I'm just like doing what I really enjoy doing, which is making up <laughs> stories within stories and finding how they connect. And, uh, and, uh, I think, yes, you know, I think you, first of all, you should do what excites you. And that's like the primary motivation of an artist um, and, and trust that people are gonna find it who are gonna appreciate it, you know? There's definitely like, I'm on the other side of a kind of divide that says like the artist should be invisible, art should be totally transparent and you just get absorbed in the world. I understand that point of view. I think personally, I think that a good work of art is gonna suck you in anyway, even if the author is waving his hand in your face every two pages. So um, it's not that I don't think you should be, be able to lose yourself it's to some level in, in art. But, but I do think that, um, you know, showing off a flourish uh, of like, wow, I can, that's a really good drawing or that's a really clever, you know, turn of word or a clever use of the medium um, can be something that is both like fun for the reader and definitely like a little feather in your cap as an artist, like, hey, I pulled that off. Um, but in that larger kind of philosophical sense of like what, you know, how does the reader supposed to inter interact with art? I always feel like I always, as a reader, when I'm a reader, I'm always thinking about the artificiality of it and the medium. And I like having that sort of, that's part of my relationship with the work of art. It's like, how is the artist kind of engaging me at multiple levels as I go through it? Right. Who else has a... Joe, if I can ask you that question about cleverness, since you said you already tried to rip off Calvino, <laughs> but also but also to ask what kind of non-cartoonist influences do you see in your own work that you bring to your own work? Oh, is he frozen on us? I think he is. <laughs> Joe, did we lose you? Right, oh, there he goes. Uh, well, maybe while we're waiting for well, Joe to get back, when if you Shing mind Wynn feeling those questions. questions. I didn't want to dominate there. Um, the, the, Craig, do you mean the, the, the first question? That, yeah, why don't you start with the first question and then you can address the cleverness yeah. issue too, if you like. Well, so I, I got into making the golf when um, the sort of craze for eBooks came, <laughs> was out like eight years ago. And I, I thought, oh, like they're, they're saying that you can, you can publish through this platform and you can add music and you can add animation. This is stuff that I love to do anyway. This, is, this, is, this would be great. This is something that maybe I feel like I have more of an original voice in. So, so that's why I was, um, that's actually why I started the golf. It, this, the golf started off as multimedia. Um, and the, the funny thing is like now, it, uh, every time I would come out with something, people would say like, can I buy a physical copy of it? And that's the only reason I, I started to like print out zine versions of, of the golf. But yeah, I mean, it's when I do, when I do bring in, you know, non-comic elements, it's uh, it's music that I've been listening to. It's things that usually though they they all kind of coalesce around some kind of tone that I'm trying to achieve. And and the 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 music. Uh, my training is jazz piano, so there's a lot of that influence. Um, and for the, the animation, I've, I've just always done little hand-drawn little doodles and um, inspired by a lot of different people that do that kind of work. So, All right. Thank you. Joe, how about you? Um, what kind of non-cartoonist influence do you bring into your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. A lot Besides Calvino, which we already know about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a problem with uh, when you get really into comics you start reading everything in that way anyway so it all become, kind of becomes like this very na very narrow reading of stuff often so I look at a lot of print making and different kinds of like graphic visuals whatever and um, often end up reading them as if they were comics which is perhaps not as they were intended I don't know but I look uh, 
I spend a lot of time looking at um, like Eduardo Palozzi and Joe Tilson and Arby Katai and specifically their printmaking work. Um, and then in terms of like, I often try and like focus on some emotional tone or whatever, that's a very slippery idea. And I, but when in the drawings, I often look at like, um, you know, pretty obvious stuff like Edward Monk or particularly prints and drawings, you know, and that kind of thing. And that stuff tends to feed very directly into my work. Um, and like I was saying earlier with that Calvino stuff, I started off like just directly quoting stuff and I do that with imagery quite a bit as well, I guess. Just like see an image and just quote it and that becomes like a thing to hang a little sequence on or a story on or something, you know. Um, but all sorts of things, yeah. All right, great, thank you. And, and thank you for providing a segue to my next question, which is that one of the, the things that you obviously have to take into account when you're trying to sort of create even just a, a more conventional comic story, but beyond that, even something that's maybe more uh, formally, you know, adventurous is the differences between print and uh, distributing it online in some way. I'm thinking specifically of uh, Shing, who uh, you've had several comics on the nib, and, yes. and and but you also have books in in book form. Uh, and I'm wondering what what kind of different considerations do you have to have for each format. Uh, where the page breaks are for one, yeah, um, <laughs> for sure. Like, uh, I I love the freedom of making comics for the web. Uh, there's just so much more you can do. And in contrast, I feel like um, like books have 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 so many more constraints to them. But at the same time, and this is, you know, obviously common in comics, yeah. you get to pace the audience experience with a book so much easier than you can via uh, you know, a scroll or whatever, or, yeah. scroll yeah. or side scroll comics. Um, like your user experience is moderated by the page, by the physical page that a person has to turn. And I love that about it. Um, so I don't know. I, I like both. They have different considerations, mostly in terms of pacing, size, uh, how much dumb stuff you can add in it. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I, I loved Wynn's inclusion of music in in their comic like that that was fantastic i love that so much yeah i was going to ask when the same question which is you know what about the different formats and how did you feel about having to put uh later chapters of the gulf into published form like i mean printed form yeah rather At first, than I, I was first i was kind of offended like well <laughs> don't you like what i did but um it's so fun to to print and you know hand staple your own comics so i i totally I like doing both and um, I, now I'm kind of behind in terms of adding the multimedia elements because then I started to think of it as a print comic. And if, if you don't kind of start at the beginning, like where does, is the story taking me? And if it's, if it's most appropriate to have a little moment of animation here or there, or you know, to, this is supposed to be a piece of music, then it, I don't want it to be kind of like a, you know, an afterthought or just like a DVD extra. So it's a little tricky that way. You mean you have to find a way to organically integrate it into this? Yeah, story. yeah. Okay. okay. I will add to that, that Jeez. printing has so much more potential in terms of like weird, like physical ephemera that you can have in a book. Yeah. Um, like, you know, like even for instance, I'm thinking about, about Matt's book. Like what if that additional page was an actual physical comic <laughs> oh, yeah. page? Did you and Tom talk about just, that or? No, I never, I mean, board. yeah, no, I, various, I, I imagine like there's definitely a version, deluxe version of this book, <laughs> but it would need to be really totally reconceived or it would actually be yeah. like building stories or something for Square's thing where it's like lots of little, but to be honest, I, I do actually like, uh, and this is the Nabokov in me, I guess, it's like controlling, like you said, controlling the reader, how you go through it. And if you just give them a box full of stuff, yeah. um, you know, there's a freedom to that. Um, but even then you want to sort of direct, you know, mm -hmm. readers to, to, to look at certain things. Um, but yeah, it just, it was, it sounded so impossibly unwieldy to try and do something like that with this book. Uh, Shrink wrap but, and know. everything to keep the page in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Joe, I wanted to ask you about this because you, as art director at, Bra at Breakdown, you know, mm -hmm. obviously you're dealing a lot with physical books. And also in window pane, the, the, the colors are so, oh, do we lose me? Ah, there he goes. And also in window pane, the colors are so saturated and so sort of unusual for the printed page. How do you feel about the difference between working for online and, and working in published form? Uh, well, not very much really, because I've never done anything for online explicitly, <laughs> not consciously. I mean, I don't mind other people doing it, but it's not something I've thought about very much, you know? Mm -hmm. And not something not like I don't very often engage with comics online, I suppose, which is to my detriment, I, I guess. Um, do you do you like do you like designing the book though? I mean, obviously, if you're yeah, I like the object. Like I like, I mean, I like the whole that whole thing. I like the life of the book and everything. And um, you know, my book, my friend Tom, who runs Breakdown as well, uh, found some some copies of some of my books in a charity shop the other day, and uh, bought them. And that was quite nice. But then also I felt like a bit annoyed that he bought them and not left them for someone else to buy for 50 <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Um, because that would have been like a nice, you know, that ongoing journey and this, the fact that they exist for, mm. well, for a while anyway. Right. Like What's the name of that a, website a where you can put a code in the book and you can follow it and people check in with it online? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I've never heard of that. Yeah, there is a website out there where you literally put a code in the book and you can log online and type in the title or the, the code of the book and you can see where it's been and who owned it previously. So if they choose to put their name, so that's kind of interesting. That is but cool. Yeah, it is. It's neat. Um, okay. Um, any, any, any questions that you guys wanted to ask each other about these issues or? Okay. All right. There was something about cleverness you were saying earlier and I got yeah. cut out. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I had anything particular to say about it, but there's, <laughs> I, I agree that it's like a pejorative thing to be that idea of cleverness and that way of talking about it. Mm. Uh, and the only thing I was going to say, I like, I think of it maybe as wit more in people that I admire, not in myself, but like if you think about Calvino or something like that, they're always funny. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I, I think funny, funny is part of it, but as we all know, comedy doesn't get the attention that it deserves, right? Yeah. And there's that, you know. And because I do feel I do have that reaction of like you know tensing up when you say like it's clever or something. I know that's, that's right. That's right. Thing, but, yeah. Okay. Well, I see we're rounding two o'clock, so maybe we'll have time for one more question and a little discussion about it. Which is, I just wanted to ask each of you to partially promote your work, but also to find out for myself. Um, what is what is what is the project you last worked on? Uh, whether it be long-term projects like, uh, say, Wynn is working on another chapter of of the Gulf, or shorter pieces. So this is a chance to promote your work and talk about what you're trying to do new in that work. I don't have any order, but if anybody wants to go first, that's fine. <laughs> go ahead, Wynn, since I invoked the Gulf. Yeah. Uh, so I'm tr I'm. Throughout the pandemic, I kept a, 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 a little diary and that, that became a little pandemic memoir. And so that the, the, the first chunk of that, the first 50 pages, I, I completed and it felt really final, like it felt like it was done. But then, you know, the pandemic just kept going. Right? <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, I'm writing this thing and, and, you know, like nobody's interested in hearing about anybody's pandemic story, but I have to, I have to keep doing it. I got to get it done. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to finish. Is this like a, a daily practice for you to draw in the journal or is it? Yeah. I mean, it, it was, I, I stopped doing the daily practice in the beginning of the summer. And, and I said to myself, okay, this is going to be the end of this thing. <laughs> So now I need to, you know, then I, then I did both the story outline and right. I'm actually, actually going to ink everything and, and draw everything. Right. So advantages, it, it provoked you to work. Disadvantages, it prolonged the pandemic. Thanks a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's my fault. It's my, it, this was actually even before the Delta variant hit. So. Oh, okay. Crazy. So yeah, that's right. That's right. I forgot the summer. There was about three weeks where we yeah. thought we were out of the woods. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Ends on a hopeful note. That's right. <laughs> Matt, did you get up and bring something to show us? Uh, yeah, well, or? so I got um, a copy of Bridge, which is my the 24 hour comic I was talking about. This came out in March from Koosh, uh, which I think most people watching this panel are going to be familiar with. It's SBX, but uh, Koosh is an amazing 
small publisher based in Latvia and they have an anthology and they also do these mini Kush series um, that are really worth checking out. And I was really uh, pleased that they, they published this, uh, this little story because um, it, uh, well, me and Dave, I, actually Dave Collier and I were in the same batch of four that come out in sets, but it's like, it definitely feels like getting to hang out with the cool young kids, you know, <laughs> to be able to be uh, included in this. So that is still available to, to order and stuff. Um, and like, you know, the indie comic bookstores have it. And then, so, you know, my big deal is of course, um, Ex Libris and here's nice and big. Another thing about a book versus uh, web comics, you'll never have a web comic with end papers. You know, there are Ooh, certain yes. things about the, yeah. the quality of the book and like, you know, spot varnish on the cover and yeah. all this stuff that are just really rewarding. And um, so this, the drop date is October 12th that's pending the books actually arriving but it looks like it's going to work out um so i'll be doing a bunch of stuff to promote it and um you can if i'm allowed to say this you can pre-order it from uncivilized books and get 20 percent off and i'm doing a little art print for it and stuff um so this is huge for me because the last 99 ways to tell a story exercise and style my last like fully solo book of my own comics came, that came out in 2005 a long time ago you know, I've been busy in the meantime. We did textbooks, uh, Jessica, Abel, and I, and we were doing the best American comics. We had two children, moved to France, all that stuff. But um, I have been making comics in the meantime. But you know, uh, I did. I, I actually like doing short comics, short stories, and short comics most of all. And uh, yet another strategy with Ex Libris was a way to like repurpose short stories I'd done that I wanted more people to see. Put them in a larger narrative and say, "Hey, it's a novel." You know. Um, so I do have. In terms of like upcoming projects, I would like to do a collection of other uncollected short comics that I've done over the last, you know, 15, 20 years that haven't been collected. Um, and, uh, but I'm really, you know, planning to spend much of the next year publishing this book and sort of being like, hey, I'm back. I'm a cartoonist. I'm not just a dad anymore, you know, and uh, enjoy having something I can actually share with people. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I have a couple of comics projects and I even doing like a short Going to try a short writing thing, which I'll do as a sort of fanzine first and see how it goes before deciding to maybe consider it as a book kind of thing. Uh, I'm doing a lot of translation still. I'm doing stuff for Europe Comics, which is like online thing. It's a lot of, but it's like I'm translating people like Catherine Maurice and you know some pretty major authors and a lot of more commercial stuff. Uh, I have this relationship with New York Review Comics, where I published uh, Baudouin's uh, Edmond Baudouin's book Pierrot. And um, well, and Joe, you mentioned uh, the, the Zabim sisters, which I did yep. a while ago, but um, that's still out there by Alisto Fan. One of the great comics of all times in my book, both those books actually, Pierrot, yeah. and also uh, yeah. Mitchum, the, the uh, Blutch collection, which is a lot of people my age, Mitchum was like totally changed. You know, like if you look at Craig Thompson and a lot of artists of my generation and Jessica Abel too, it's like, we all saw, blush and like man we got to up our dry, that dry brush <laughs> <Yeah>. something else <laughs> so much more to come great yeah, i've got great. it on the floor somewhere behind me <laughs> I, don't, yeah. don't know where, but I was just looking at it the other day you let it get outside of a, the the span of your hands come yeah on. <laughs> <laughs> no it is a beautiful book uh, i did want to say that i did an interview with tom kaczynski of uncivilized and he he talked about the process by which you and you and he designed the book and mentioned that he was the one who thought of the idea of continuing the spiral into the end papers or at least he took yeah. credit for that <laughs> oh yeah no that was because i had i came up with the concept of the book being the cover being a book, another book cover within a comic book inside it and sort of this spiral thing. And then uh, he had that, yeah, he had the idea of using that spiral on the, on the rug, which is a motif, kind of light motif throughout the whole book to bring it out to the whole cover. And that really like, that was what brought it together. And even it pulled it together. Yeah. To the back cover. He, it was also his cool idea to have the, this Ooh, weird cool. PC code that like <laughs> slips <laughs> off the bottom uh, of the book. You know? so, like little subversions like that. And even yeah. like the title, if I can just show one more thing there. The title page kind of goes across, you know, you're not supposed to really do that in good design, I don't think, but it works great here, having it sort of bleed onto the facing page. So Neat. Yeah, Tom and I had a lot of fun putting it together. Does the barcode still work if it's wonky? Oh yeah. Well, well I guess we'll see when it comes out. But the idea is that <laughs> yeah. that's right. It's parallel lines that so should work, right? I don't know. 
So Shing, have you have you had trouble doing installations during the pandemic? I mean, I would think that would be yeah. a real problem. <laughs> uh, yes, but what was, have you been working on? Uh, well, the yes, the installation problem is part of the reason why I shifted focus to making games because it's a way of kind of bringing that kind of experiential design into smaller home spaces. So um, comics wise, uh, what's that? Blah. Sorry, <laughs> I grabbed it earlier. Legend of Monty Poe came out in uh, June. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's my sort of subversion of the Paul Bunyan myth, uh, which is an American myth that I'm obsessed over. And, um, and then Amending, which is my embroidery card game, was fulfilled and delivered in, I think, April or May. Um, I've got more comic stuff coming, but the thing Im immediately on my plate is that I'm currently kickstarting an immersive narrative mail game called Remember August, and it's going to land eight letters from your childhood friend that you don't remember uh, in your actual mailbox in February, 2022. So wow. as of now, I think I'll be dispatching over 5,000 letters. Um, not, not like personally, like, right, right. But, obviously. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm really excited about that. And kind of this, this, you know, very male based form of storytelling where the United States Postal Service is almost like a third character. Um, <laughs> it's very much like a narrative about the rhythm of like waiting and the rhythm of like checking mm. your mail. Um, oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, it's it's up on Kickstarter right now, <laughs> and um, and yeah, I, I'm working on you know some non. I'm going to be pitching a narrative nonfiction book soon that's about the evolution. Again, I'm really into Paul Bunyan, uh, the evolution of the Paul Bunyan mythos in the United States, and kind of wow. how that exploration works, you know, with my life as an immigrant and sort of my understanding of you know this very Americana centric American identity. Thank you. That sounds real. I, I, I found myself thinking, well, I'm going to get one of those. Uh, I'm going to join Remember August and I'm going to also get a couple for people for Christmas or something like that. Ooh, yeah. That's a neat idea. So, sorry, I don't mean to add to your 5,000 plus. But. Oh, no, 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 I'm not. I, I'm using, uh, it's actually wonderful. I'm using um, direct mail, which is the way you receive political mail and spam mail in your, in oh. your mailboxes, but I'm using it for art. That's right, so and for good. <laughs> it, is, it is an existing system in place that allows me to do it. And I, it's logistically complicated, but completely, I've, I've been spending six months figuring it out. <laughs> That's great. Joe, you showed us pictures from uh, pages from your new oh, yeah, yeah. book, but it, we didn't get its name. Tell us its name. Uh, that, one doesn't, that one doesn't have a name yet. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> although I didn't really think it was about the pandemic, but it's about a uh, something that rips a, this city apart, some big monster, and then it turns into a, that's the catalyst for a love story between two donkeys, which is the focus of uh, the thing. <laughs> 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 um, but that's very much in in process and then there's all, all and it's like stories emerging from within this from within each these different characters so a couple of the characters like whiz out a story and it's about a river and all this sort of thing but i just finished a book um or just like ages ago now it seems uh which is about a sort of seagull spirit thing kidnapping a child um which is does is about 200 pages long and I'm certainly not capable of explaining, um, but there's no words in it at all. Uh, and I'm just, I'm, I'm doing a bunch of drawings. I've got a drawing taped in my drawer desk. I just finished this one. And they're not really comics, but it's like, a, like I was saying, they're like very much are uh, comics because they're just like two images together. Um, and- uh, That color sense. Yeah, and like really obnoxious colors. No, no. <laughs> that's, that's the original page there, Joe. Joe, that's the yeah, original? that's it. Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah, so they're just like oil drawing with? It's oil sticks and oil pastels and okay. you know just scalpel and other things. Huh. Scratching, scratching in. Fantastic. Um, and that's I'm going to show some of that stuff at the end of the month in in Italy and in Hamburg. Um, yeah, and then Breakdown Press has like a always has like a massive backlog of things we have to sort out and emails we owe people and books that should have come out a year ago and you know all that stuff people have mostly been quite tolerant with us but hopefully we're doing um I can't remember what's next we're doing um some more yokoyama i think we're going to be publishing baby boom which is a good formal a good formal sure, yeah definitely that's right, that's right. Yeah. um and a bunch of other stuff 
I just yeah. picked up um, Pits of Hell, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Oh, yeah. Good stuff about that. Yeah, we're doing another Ubisoft book as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, yeah. All right. Well, does anybody have any last comments before we uh, call it a day? Anybody? Not really. Thanks, Craig, for uh, taking the time to talk with us. Not at all. It was a pleasure yeah. to get to know your art. <laughs> for those of you who I didn't know before, and pleasure to meet you. It's It's been wonderful. I just hope we can do it in uh, SPX 2022 in person. That would yeah. be yeah. lovely. <laughs> yeah. yeah all right. Thanks, a lot. thanks, everybody. Great to meet you guys. Nice to meet you guys. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.